This is going to be a little different than the usual presentation. Uh, I actually want it to be interactive. So uh, let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, I've been uh, teaching some kids in China um, about mechatronics. So mechatronics are robotics. And uh, that's electronics, mechanics, computers, computer control, feedback control. And since these kids are in China, um, they're obviously, I can, it's all through Zoom. And, in, uh, and I, uh, when I teach, I like to do things hands-on. And so I've been working hard to figure out ways for them to learn to do uh, electronic and mechanical systems using things that are online. And I've discovered uh, some really cool online simulators of, uh, for electronics and mechanical systems that are, will run in a browser, uh, so it's free. Uh, you don't have to load anything on your computer. You can just get online and run these things. And uh, I want to demonstrate a little bit about that. And uh, I originally, it was going to be about uh, simulators for electronics. Realized it's a radio, our radio club. So one of the things I discovered recently is one of the simulators that I've been using for things like operational amplifiers and transistors and other electronic components. Uh, also, they have vacuum tubes. Okay, so I'm going to show you some vacuum tube circuits and some simple things that you can do with these online systems. And then I've also brought in some of the lecture demonstrations that I use in my course on the history of engineering. And I have uh, the ones that I brought in are from my lecture on the history of uh, wireless telegraphy and radio. So I thought I'd demonstrate uh, some of these devices that I use in my lectures. And as I said, I want, would like this to be interactive. And my purpose of doing this is really um, to show you how easy it is to do this. And if any of you work with young people or old people or want to teach yourself more about electronics, these simulators are really great. Um, so the real question is how I want to begin. So let me tell you what the two simulators are that I'm using. So one of them is called Falstad. And by the way, the page here, I was hoping Al would be here tonight. I'm going to use some of Al's uh, diagrams to replicate using these simulators. So I don't know if you've seen, I hope everybody has seen Al's site. He's got this great site about his crystal radios. And this is one of the diagrams that I'm going to be looking at. And uh, the, so this is crystal radio. Obviously, it needs no external power other than, uh, uh, other than getting your signals in from the airwaves. So we have an inductor and a variable capacitor. So this is a tank circuit, a resonant circuit. You have an AM, uh, an AM modulated uh, carrier wave that comes in. And then there's a detector. In this case, it's a solid state diode. Uh, I'm going to show you, we're going to make a detector out of a, a vacuum triode uh, and a set of uh, earphones in which you use to extract the low frequency modulation. And I'm going to show you how you can model this very nicely in one of these simulators. So let me bring up the first simulator. And this is, it also has a Princeton connection to it that I learned recently. It's, it's Falstad, F-A-L-S-T-A-D. And let me really emphasize, this is running in a browser. So you're not downloading any software. Any of you that get on uh, Google or any of your uh, Chrome or any of your browsers can get into this. And I, I really like this, uh, this simulator. So when you bring it up, uh, it comes up and it has some very nice simulations. So this case, this is a, uh, an LRC circuit. So that's that tank circuit, that resonant circuit. And uh, you can see that those yellow dots are representing the current as it flows. Uh, and then in the, on, uh, there are scopes that you can bring up. So you can look at voltage and current uh, across any device. So for example here, this is the inductor, and we're looking at the voltage and current in the inductor, and you see they're 90 degrees out of phase because it's purely reactive. The capacitor is also voltage and current, also 90 degrees out of phase, different phase shift. Um, uh, 
Again, it's purely reactive. And then the resistor, the voltage and current are in phase. And again, it's very easy to bring up an oscilloscope. Also, if you look at the colors, let me close the switch there. So this is really interactive. So if I close the switch, that gets current. What that's doing is putting current through the inductor. Right? And then I open the switch, and there's a back EMF. Now notice it goes red and green. You see that? So when it's red, that means that section is uh, negative, and when it's green, it's positive. The brighter the red, the larger the negative number, the brighter the green, the larger the positive number. So it has some very nice uh, visualizations. Now, I, I also mentioned that this has a Princeton connection. Uh, this, the person who did this was a computer science student at Princeton. Uh, I think he was, uh, it was about the year 2000, something like that. And he did this as a hack. So it makes no money from it. He just posted it. He actually has this marvelous website. He has simulations for quantum mechanics. He has this circuit simulator. He's got a bunch of other things. Uh, I tracked him down. I have not been in direct contact with him, but he lives in the Chicago area. And for a living, he makes uh, applications for phones uh, having to do with music processing. So I think he makes money that way. And again, he's just, you know, just a smart kid. Uh, but terrific simulator. So let me show you. So that's one simulator that we'll look at. Okay, then the other one that I'm going to uh, work with is by Autodesk. That one you actually have to sign up for, but if, if you're, uh, you can get a trial version, and I, th if you, I know students can get free access to it. And I think members of the general public, you can get sort of a limited, uh, limited access. And it's a, it's a program called Tinkercad. So a lot of schools use this. Have any of you have heard of Tinkercad? Yeah, I've used it too. Okay. So Tinkercad, it's, uh, it's an Autodesk product. Um, and I personally don't like it for the CAD. That's the computer-aided design. But have you used the circuits part of it? No, I used it for... Very, very, very rudimentary 3D model for a 3D printer. Yeah, so th this is really cool. So let me get in here. So I have to log in. I thought I was logged. Oh, I am logged in, so I'm going to go to designs. So, so, you know, you can do things like it says tinker this. I'll just show you. This is the CAD part of it. So a lot of kids are, are using this. So it allows you to, you know, here you can draw a spring and you can. You can make different objects and move them around, and, and then you can 3D print it. Now, I, I think that that's, that part of it is basically a toy, but the part that is spectacular, and I mean spectacular, has to do with their, cir their circuits. So they have a circuit simulator here, and so the circuit simulator allows you to bring in, for example, here's a breadboard. And um, I can bring in components. So for example, let me just sh show you this. I'll bring in a light emitting diode. So here's a light emitting diode. All right. So I put it on the board there. And I can bring in a resistor. There's a resistor. Oops, all right, let's move this over. So I've, let's see, that's the anode. <coughs> so to the cathode, the cathode I'm going to want to make negative. Okay, let me bring in a battery. Let's bring in a 9-volt battery. So if it's a 9-volt battery, okay, and I'll put in a wire. So let's make the wire. I even like to color code these wires. Let's say I'll do black, negative. I'll wire it into this strip. And then I'll change the color of the wire to red. I encourage the students to color code their circuits into the strip there, so that resistor 
is in there. It's going to the anode. So the cathode I need to put to ground. So I'll take another wire. I'll make it a black wire. Clicking on this, take the black wire, and I'll put it to, to there. And then I can hit Start Simulation. And lo and behold, you can see that lighting up. Okay. Now, it's one thing that's really cool about this that's better than Falstad is it also has some limits. So I'll stop the simulation. And something that my students do all the time when they work with light emitting diodes is they forget to put the resistor in. That's a classic problem. Okay, so let's click on the resistor. Why am I not finding the resistor? Oh, I, I'm start simulation. I'm supposed to be able to change the value. There it is. So that's 1K ohm. Let's make it 1 ohm. Okay, and then I'll start the simulation and watch what happens. <laughs> Isn't that great? So when I actually, with some of the other simulators that I use, you can do these things that would, if you built it, it would actually be smoking. Yes, Dave. I used to do that with uh, CK722 transistors. This seems a lot less expensive. It absolutely is. So, so uh, and they have the collection of components that they have there. Uh, they don't have everything. So there's a, there is a, a very expensive package that you can get. It's, I think it's called the Pegasus package that costs about one or two thousand dollars a year that has a lot more components. This one though has all the basic components that you might want for teaching electronics. Yes? In this current simulation, yep. does it change the value of the LED to be an open circuit now? Uh, it does not. So it just it shows you if you if you mouse over it, it just says current through the LED is 808 milliamps, while the absolute maximum is 20 milliamps. Okay. So it won't it won't damage it and then leave it as a damaged part. It just flags it. But I think that's great because most of these simulators will not tell you that there's a problem. And then they have things like multimeters. So let's just again let's pull up a couple of these things. So where's my search here? Okay, so I can bring in a multimeter. Okay, there's a multimeter. So here it is. So if I wanted to see how much current's flowing in that, um, so there's a multimeter allows me to, it's amps, volts. You know, I could, let's do it on uh, current, for example. And it's a perfect multimeter. So, for example, this is uh, the direction of current. If I take this wire and get rid of it, let's make that wire from the cathode. I'll bring it to the uh, positive side here. And then I'll take the negative and bring it to ground there. And it's reading amperes. And I'll start the simulation. And there's that 808 milliamps. So you can put in meters, very simply. And yet it's got a voltmeter, it's got an amp meter, it's got a resistance meter. Uh, it also has an oscilloscope, it's got transistors, it's got operational amplifiers, it has motors and encoders. And actually, while I'm on the Tinkercad, and then we'll get to the, to the other one, let me, uh, and let me name this. We'll just call this uh, uh, NJARC. Okay, so I've, I'll save it. Let me bring up an, another one. This is what I do with my students on the mechatronics. So if any of you are interested in learning about these Arduinos, has anybody here worked with an Arduino or a microcomputer? Well, OK. So if you wanted to learn about this, uh, and this, this is just spectacular, um, I'll just put basic here. I'll search. I'll put Arduino. So here's an Arduino Uno. So I can bring that over here. Um, the code for it, they have two different ways of programming it. So this is the code blocks. So for teaching kids about using these computers, code blocks are pretty easy. It's just like a jigsaw puzzle. 
Uh, and so there, it comes equipped with a, a, a stock program to get you started. So this is a loop that runs forever. It says set the built-in light emitting diode to high, wait one second, set the built-in light emitting diode to low, wait a second, and then just keep doing it. So the built-in light emitting diode is right here. This is this little light. It's on pin 13. And then if I click start simulation, if you look there, you can see that light is blinking. You can see that? And then, again, just to give you an idea of this, oh, so that's one thing, so I'll stop the simulation. They also, for those that are more sophisticated, and uh, the Arduinos are usually programmed in the C programming language. In addition to the code blocks, they give you the equivalent of that that would be in C, which C is one of the programming language that we uh, use a lot. And it, it, it gives you the exact same elements uh, written in C code that allow you to then, you can take this code, you can put it in, if you have a real Arduino, and they're in their, what they call their, uh, their design environment. You transfer it to the design environment, and then you can run it. So you can try things out here, and then you can try it in your, on your little workshop. You can also go the other way, uh, where you can actually, uh, there are a lot of people will post code uh, that for various applications, running a stepper motor or whatever. You can take that code, bring it in here, and then try running it and see how it, how it operates. So uh, this is also something that's, and I'll show you one thing that I do with my students before we get to the other simulator. Um, let's go back to the code. Um, here's a, a, a gadget that I use a lot, which is a servo. So these are mechanical s servos, servo mechanisms. It's a slave device. They use these in model airplanes a lot. And again, just to show you how easy it is to use this, I'm going to wire this up. Let's get the colors right. As I said, I always color code these things. So ground it will be black. So I'll bring the ground wire over here. It's got a very nice way to wire things up. That's ground. It needs power. Let's change the color to red for power. And by the way, uh, one of the things, and this actually, uh, I was working with some kids this morning, and I had been teaching them about some circuits using the other simulator. And something that I find with a lot of my students is we work with schematic diagrams, and they learn how to design a circuit. And then what happens is, you know, they're fine. They can, you know, understand the circuit, and they can manipulate it. And then I say, go build it. So when they go build it, they're dealing with a transistor that has, you know, the transistor one in a schematic has three wires. You know, it's got a collector going on the top and an emitter on the bottom and a base on the left. But the transistor as a part has three leads on it. And sometimes they're in strange order. And the students, many of them, have great difficulty going from the schematic diagram to the physical wires. So I, working with both of these systems, I find it's useful. So if they really get the experience of what it's like to, uh, to do these things uh, as if they were in the lab. Okay, so here's yellow. So this is all I have to do for this one. I need to have just three wires hooked up. I'll hook it into pin number eight on the Arduino here. Okay, there it is. And then we'll, uh, and I'll move this over to the left. And then I'll go to the code. Now I'm gonna get rid of the block plus text. Let's just do it as blocks. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this code that was there before, and I'm going to go, you see, rotate servo on pin whatever to a certain number of degrees. I put it on pin number eight. So I'll go to pin eight. Let's say I'll rotate that to, whoops. I'll rotate that to, let's say, 90 degrees. Here's 90 degrees. And then I'll... Uh, go to control, I'll wait, let's say, you know, these are 
it's, as I said, it's sort of, it's, it's hard to mess up the program. Let's wait three seconds. Okay, and then I'll go back to um, our input. And that's input, it's output. Oh, it's output. Uh, rotate the servo on pin. Okay, let me make this pin eight. Let's rotate it to, how about uh, 180 degrees? Go back to control, bring this guy in. Wait another three seconds. Let's do it again. Go back to output, rotate servo on pin eight. On pin eight again. And let's rotate it to zero, and I'll do one more wait, and then we'll run it. Okay. And again, I'll do it three seconds. Okay, and um, I think I can get rid of the code, and then we'll just run it. And you can see the servo moving. Mm -hmm. Really simple. And then on top of that, I can bring out an oscilloscope. Actually, let's do this because this is one, one last thing I, I do this often. Suppose I want to look at the electrical signals that are being sent to that, uh, to that servo motor. So this is also something that I teach about. So I can bring in a scope. Now, my one gripe is that their oscilloscope is a one-channel oscilloscope. And I'm still trying. I've, I, have a, I have a hack that I'll do multiple channels, but it, I'm not happy with it. <laughs> OK, so there's positive, negative. OK, so let me make that wire black. I'll bring it in here. Here it's to ground. And then I want to look at the signal. Let's make that yellow. I'll hook the oscilloscope up here. There, I'm hooked into the signal. And I have to set the time base. I'll set it to one millisecond per division. And then I'll run start simulation. And so what it's showing me is the way you code the information in, you change the pulse width that you send to the servo, this little servo mechanism. And as you can see on the scope, you can actually look at the electrical signals as it's running. This is pretty cool. I mean, I just think that it's, uh, and as I said, students learn how to wire things up. You can try things out. You know, uh, you don't have to strip any wires. And then uh, once you sort of understand how it works, you can get the actual item and then uh, run it in your workshop. And like you say, it also tells you that something will not work. Yes, absolutely. Now, it's not perfect. Um, you know, I've, I've done some very complicated things with this. We actually made an analog computer out of op amps. It's one of the projects that I have with the students, um, which is, uh, you know, it, it's a, and it works uh, reasonably well. There's a function generator. Unfortunately, the function generator doesn't run very slowly. It, it has pretty high frequency. You can't get to low frequency. So you have to hack some things. But it's really spectacular. Okay, so that's the, on Tinkercad. Now let's go and take a look at Falstad again. So I was showing you Falstad. Now I brought up a couple of things here. This is a voltage divider. So this is one of the things that I, uh, that I uh, teach the students about simple Ohm's law, voltage and current. And so, you know, you see there's a 9K resistor in series with a 1K resistor. And um, one of the features is you can bring in a wire and if you right click on the wire and go to edit, it allows you to display things like the voltage and the current at that point. So you can actually figure out, um, you can demonstrate things and I can change the values of, of, uh, of, of constants. So for example, if I changed, let's leave that there. If I change this resistor, if I double click on it and I make it 1K, so it's two 1K resistors, and I go OK. OK, the current increases. 
you can see that with those dots moving more quickly, and you see, well, that's, that's one ohm I put in there. So look, one ohm, you make a mistake. Okay, so that's 10 volts because I'm putting 10 volts in. I want, meant to put in 1K. Okay, then it splits, splits it. And then also you can, it makes it easy to explain concepts like uh, with a potentiometer. Classic things that students do is if you know, they think that's a voltage divider. But if you draw any current from it, it stops becoming a voltage divider. So if I put a load here, so for example, if I type R for resistor and I put a load, let's say a 1K ohm load to ground and hit G for ground, Okay, all of a sudden, it's now loaded, and it's, so no, it's no longer splitting the 10 volts to 5 volts, right? Because the, the, uh, the two resistors uh, are in parallel, so it reduces the value to 500 ohms, uh, 500 ohm equivalent. So again, it's a great way to teach electronics. Now let's go to some, uh, let's go back to Al Clase's item. So I want to take a look at a couple hey, of... Hey Mike, yes. you wanted to keep this interactive, so yes. here's me interrupting you. Um, yes. the, um, one of the things that I've noticed that some people have a problem with is if you're taking uh, capacitors and putting them in series and trying to calculate the, the voltage uh, and, and, the, uh, uh, and, the, and the capacitance of the resulting circuit, mm -hmm. is, would, does this or would something like this cover so, calculations? Yes, uh, yes. So you can figure out, so what you can do is put in a pure sine wave. So the resistance of a, uh, the impedance of a capacitor is 1 over uh, j omega c. So j is the square root of minus 1. Yeah, okay. So this is actually with the students that I work with, we start off by saying, do you know about imaginary numbers? And after they're done rolling their eyes, you know, I say, okay, let me teach you about imaginary numbers. So the imaginary part, if something's purely reactive, so that if you get that phase shift where the voltage and current are not in phase with each other, so uh, you, you uh, represent that with imaginary numbers. And you can demonstrate that very nicely with a, um, with a sine wave. And you, basically, you can look at the voltage and current. You can see whether they're in phase or not. So it, it, there, are, there are ways to help with that. But it's, uh, it's not that st uh, straightforward. OK, let me just do a couple more things. So here. Um, the tank circuit, that's the, um, so this is one of the subtleties. So you have a, um, you have a capacitor, variable capacitor in parallel with an inductor. And then the inductor always has a certain amount of resistance to it. So there's never, it's never zero resistance. And that value of that resistance, this is a subtlety of these tank circuits, is if the resistance is too low, the Q of the circuit is too high. That means that uh, if you get oscillation in it, it doesn't die away. And so there's an there's a optimal uh, Q that you want to have in a circuit. And if you don't have the right Q, what happens is when you're trying to, say you're putting an amplitude modulated wave in, it distorts the wave. And actually here, I have a little demonstrator of that. Let's see. Is that the one that's, I've, I've built a couple of things for you. Um, yeah, this is it. Okay, so this is, uh, so uh, first off, there's an AM source, and that is shown on the bottom here. So the one, if I double click on this AM source, so for those of us that love radios, I double click on it. I have a carrier frequency, I put it for megahertz. And then I put the, uh, the signal frequency at 10 kilohertz. Okay, and then what I'm looking at here is um, uh, the bottom one. So I'm looking at this wire here. That's, see how it illuminates the blue at the bottom? And it's showing me it's the wire. And, um, and what it's showing me is that I'm putting this signal in the front end. I've got a big resistor in series with it for a reason to decouple it. Uh, I have 
and I used, this is the standard, I got this right off of Al's site, these variable capacitors that you have, you know, the, the knife edge, they usually go from about 20 picofarads to about 400 picofarads. So I just put in 365 picofarads, and then I figured out the value of L that would give you a resonance of one megahertz. And then I chose a value of 20, because that, the Q of this circuit is also about 20. So the Q is 1 over R times the square root of L divided by uh, square root of L over C. And as I said, it, so if the Q, that means that if I hit it with an impulse, it oscillates about 20 times and stops. Okay, now if it rings too long, then what happens uh, the, the higher the Q, the larger the amplitude that you'll get within the circuit, but you'll also, it will, uh, it'll distort the signal. So I designed this one to show you if I bring the Q from about 20, if I make it about five times larger by making that resistance, because uh, remember it's one over R, so if I make that resistance about four ohms, watch what happens, now remember, the wire is what we get out of this tank circuit. So I'll make this four ohms, and then I'll apply it to it. And you see how much bigger the amplitude has gotten here? So it's doing a better job at converting the forcing, so it's gotten bigger, but you'll also notice that it's starting to distort the wave. Okay, so that's uh, not good. So, and another way to see that in terms of how it rings, so I can throw this little switch here. I made a little pulse generator here. And let me hit reset and we'll take a look at it. So this is giving it a kick and you see it rings down, right? And this is at 10 kilohertz at the rate. So what's happening is it's averaging over that amount of time. And if I change that value of four ohms to back to 20 ohms, See, it's, it's much briefer, okay? So the idea is to get the right cue to get both good uh, sensitivity in your tune circuit as well as selectivity. So that's, there's an optimization there, and you can teach yourself about this uh, very nicely. Question, sir. Yes. And the, uh, the, the lower scheme, uh, yeah. uh, scope to the right, yep. you see some randomness in that. Is that because of aliasing? No, you mean this, actually on the transient, I should test it with a single pulse. It gets uh, one spike due to the leading edge and the, another spike due to the trailing edge. Uh -huh. So that extra piece that's there is... Yeah, so there's I see they're not the same also. Well, that's right, because... Each it, one's a little different. Well, it's, yeah, but so the, you get a larger impact on the leading side, but you remember the second one's coming in and so it's still ringing. So ideally, there's, it's, there's a phenomenon known as the Green's function. It's an impulse response function. So ideally, what you want to do is give it an infinite spike, the area of one, and what that does is it gives you a proper ringing. So that shows you what, uh, uh, what the signal would look like just in terms of its, uh, how that uh, circuit rings down. In this case, I'm doing it because I'm doing it with a square wave pulse. It's yeah, uh, it's a little disordered. Yeah. Bring it closer. Yeah. It, yes. I mean, it's called the delta function, and it's it's often the way we test uh, we test circuits. So in any case, though, this is a great way to learn about uh, tuned circuits. Now, also, let me show you. Uh, I brought up a schematic here. Oh, I'll get to this in a in a minute. I'll get to my other demos. Um, I brought in the schematic. Whoops. I'm going to show you. Where is this? I brought in the schematic. Yes, yeah, this is, uh, uh, I recently restored um, one of these Atwater Kent uh, 10, I did it, it was a straight 10. This is a 10A. And um, so this is, a, these are uh, vacuum triodes. And um, the way these circuits work, there's a tuned circuit on the front end here. Um, you go into the grid, um, and then there's an, a pot 
on the uh, on the 10 and what that does is it moves the uh, the value of the filament now these filaments these are the uh, the O1As uh, and the O1As are uh, so the film one end of the filament is you know a minus the other ends a plus so there's a voltage drop across the filament and um, and then what you can do is you can there's a ground and what you can do is you can move the, the voltage of the filament relative to the grid in such a way that it's, a, it's the equivalent of the C power supply. Right? For those of you that have worked on battery sets, the A supply runs the filament, the B is what is the high voltage on the plate, and then C is used to move the value of the grid. Okay, and so I want to just show you that if you change the value of the C power supply, you can convert this tube from being an amplifier to being a detector. So that the idea of the detector, which we'll get to in just a second, is a detector will take that AM modulated signal and it will split it in half. It's very important to, uh, because you're going to average it and you want to get the modulation out. So, the, uh, so let's first look at an RF amplifier as modeled with this Falstead. So I've got one here. Again, I put a couple of these together. Yeah, this is the RF amplifier. So, so they have a, uh, the triode that they have comes from a SPICE model. This is a, a lot of the uh, electrical engineers like to come up with these in-circuit emulator models of various parts, transistors and uh, the like. There's a good model for, uh, for triodes, um, except that it doesn't handle leakage. So again, if any of you worked on battery sets, you may have heard about the grid leak resistor, right? So if you try to model a grid leak on this one, it doesn't work. And the reason, because it doesn't have leakage in the tube. But what it does do is it gets the basic characteristics, the IV characteristics, the current voltage characteristics of the tube. I'll show you how that works in a second. Could but you, could yes? You, could you explicitly add a grid leak resistor? I could. Well, I, I could put a grid leak resistor there, but the problem is that the, what charges up the gate is the space charge that comes from boiling electrons off of the filament. Okay, and the leakage is not in the model. So you can, you can hack it. You can, you can put an extra leakage in there so it'll work. Like real radios do have a grid leak. I know, yes, yeah, so but this is a perfect example. So not everything that you simulate is going to work the way it, it's actually going to work in real life. Um, so if you just take these models, and if I double click on this tube, the tube actually has, um, I, I checked this out, let me just double click on it. So it gives you, this is a high mu tube, it's a mu of 93, and then this KG1 uh, is uh, one of the parameters that's in the SPICE model. And I'll, I'll show you how we can look at the data sheet on the on the 12AT7, which is a, a, a later AC tube that has characteristics that are similar to that. But in any case, this is acting right now as an RF amplifier. And you can see that because the signal that I'm putting in is that one that's now in blue, right? And then I'm going through, in this case, I'm going through a transformer. So I'm looking at the, uh, at the current that's flowing in the transformer. And then I'm looking at the one at the bottom there is the, uh, the voltage that I'm getting on that resistor. And you see that, um, and you know, with amplification. Okay, so that's an RF amplifier. Now I've also made a, and the only thing that I've done differently on this one, okay, well two things that I've done differently. One is I changed the voltage on the cathode. So if I made that more negative, um, it, uh, the signal will get through. In this case, I'm driving the two-bit cutoff. And so you see I'm putting in an AC signal, but what I get out in terms of the current, I'm getting something that's, that's rectified. Okay, so I lose half of the signal there. And then what I have, uh, this is simulating headphones. I have basically a resistor. 
uh, there with a capacitor across it, so it's filtering. So I'm extracting the envelope. Okay, and so this, idea, this is the idea of detection. Okay, now that actually might be a good time for me to show you this, what I brought with me, because this comes from my course uh, in which I'm trying to teach students about how radios work. Um, so first, of, are you okay with uh, what I just showed you? Okay, so it's really, you know, it's, it's really cool to do this. Uh, I started playing with a, a Colpitz uh, oscillator, uh, Hartley oscillators. I mean, they, there's some standard ones. Oh, I should, before I do this, I should show you that Falstad, this is also great. They have a bunch of circuits. You see this tab here with circuits? There are probably 500 circuits that he has modeled here. Uh, let me, oh, I'm going to open up a fresh one so I don't lose this one. So I'll go to Falstad. Uh, and as I said, I use these, sometimes I use their circuits, sometimes I use my own. Um, so they're logic circuits, sequential logic, transmission lines, phase lock loops, I mean all sorts of things. Let me just pull up one. Um, well, here's a diode IV curve. Okay, so this is... Okay, so here's a, so down at the bottom here, they, they're running an AC source through a diode, and they're looking, that's current versus voltage. So this is an exponential curve of growth. Um, so again, there are lots of sample circuits that are there. Uh, they have logic circuits, they have flip-flops, um, analog devices, MOSFETs, let's see, um, here's a sample and hold. So this is, uh, actually I'm not even sure. So this one's done with op amps. Let's just pick a, a different one. Yeah, you, you get the idea. There are just lots of different, uh, here, 555 timer, square wave generator. So this is uh, one of the standard chips that we use for generating square wave. So he, lots of examples that are built into it. Now let me come to my little demonstrator here. Uh, camera. Okay, so this is a device that I use for. Oh, let's let's make that full screen so we don't have the. So back to that tank circuit. You know, the tank circuit is a resonant circuit. Well, the mechanical equivalent of that is a spring mass damper. So you see what I have here. I have something that oscillates and then it slows down and stops. Okay, and by the way, we're sort of proud of this. Um, it's, uh, we have to make electrical measurements on it. So it is attached, show this, this is sort of a, it's in the weeds. Uh, this device down at the bottom here is called an LVDT. So this is a, there's a piece of iron that's moving up and down between two coils of wire. So it's, uh, it's an inductor, right, and there's an upper coil and a lower coil. Depending on where the iron is, you can set it up in a bridge circuit and you can determine the position of the iron without touching anything. So you don't have to worry about damping. Okay, so it, in other words, there's no contact measurement of position. And then to generate the damping, down at the bottom here, there's a little, this is a, our invention. It's a, uh, it's attached again to that rod that's going up and down. There's a magnet that's sitting inside of a copper pipe. So that produces an eddy current that slows it down, again, without touching. So we were able to get it to oscillate, but also to introduce damping. And then what, what we do here, I'll just show you. I'm going to turn this on. I have, oh, at the top here is a, basically a loudspeaker. So that's a linear motor. And then I'm going to uh, turn on a current, an AC current to the motor. And if you look closely, you see this effect of forced, this is resonance. Notice that's moving just a small amount. But you see how much this is moving? Okay, so that comes, that would be the Q factor. So that's the extra energy stored in the oscillator. 
So it's yeah. equivalent, it's equivalent to a series tuned LC circuit. The voltage is the junction between the L and the C. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, and then the induction the induction is the equivalent of the inertia, yeah. right? And then the uh, the capacitance is the spring. Okay, so it's, again, it's a mechanical equivalent to what I just showed you with the with the tank circuit. And then what I have here. Uh, so we've got this attached to my laptop computer, and we'll run it. So I ran it before. Let's see if I can, you can see this. And let me just start another recording. Let's see if I can get a little closer. Is that stopping occasionally because the frequency is so matched? No, it's uh, amplitude modulated. Oh, okay. Yeah, so what's happening is if you looked at the, what it's, it's the forcing function on there. Let's see if I wonder if I can get that a little bit bigger on the screen. So, um, let's see, control plus. Yeah, there we go. I like this camera. I use these cameras a lot in my in my lectures. So what we have at the bottom here, this is the measurement. So in other words, I'm forcing it. So this is that, and I, if I change the carrier frequency the, on that, I wouldn't get such a large amplitude. So in other words, I've got my forcing function to match to the natural resonance of that circuit. We have the students do it. And then we, in software, we chop off the bottom, and then we average it, and this is so we're getting the envelope function uh, sorted out. So this is what happens in a radio, right? So you, you need a detector to basically take that AC signal that's as much positive as negative, just make it from zero to positive, filter it, and then that's the signal that you get that you hear in your uh, earphones. Just to explain this idea of, um, to explain this idea of detection. And while I have the camera here, let me show you one other one that I use in lecture. Um, this one, maybe I should drop this. I'll drop the legs here a little bit. Um, I also explain about vacuum tubes. Oops, I've made that big, so let me make it small again. So control O, oops, control minus. So I have an O1A there. So I was uh, trying to explain what Edison did. So the Edison effect, you may have heard about this. Edison, I think it was 1883, uh, he figured out uh, that current would flow one way in a, in a light bulb. So he was doing a study as why the lamp, the lamp and uh, his bulbs were darkening. And he discovered this one-way uh, flow, which is basically a vacuum diode. Um, and then it was others. Fleming was the, who used to work for Edison, wound up actually doing the first uh, vacuum diode. So I was trying to explain about uh, vacuum diodes. And so what I've got here is I have a little function generator in the back that's putting an AC signal in. And just to show you that there's an AC signal, I'm going to short circuit the, the tube here. And if you look on the galvanometer, oops. Is that, uh, it's in standby, it shouldn't be in standby. Okay, so you see the galvanometer is going positive and then negative. So what I've done is I've shorted the, uh, the plate to the filament. So I'm bypassing it. And now I'm gonna disconnect that clip lead. Okay, and then when I turn on my uh, filament, I'll see that AC signal's being put on there, and I'll see that I just get it going in one direction, not the other, because I'm boiling electrons off that hot filament. And to do it with the O1A, I didn't have a vacuum diode, so I short-circuited I short the grid to the plate. 
Okay, so I have two leads. I basically have the filament on one side and then the grid and the plate together on the other. So it just shows that the direction is going in, in one way. And then if I turn it off, let me let it be conducting. I turn the power off on the filament. Whoops. I actually got a, I wonder why it got a big. So usually it stays hot for a while. I, uh, yeah. And you can, you can see that it, it, uh, it just continues. Okay, but again, this is just a simple little demonstrator. Again, to get the, the students used to the idea that this, these electronics ideas really work, and then I usually pull the tube out and show that there are only four leads on it. So it's you know, a really simple device. Okay, let's see if there's what else I have here. I'm almost done. Um, I think I had a couple other circuits. Oh yeah, let's do this. Uh, this is, I went and got the uh, data sheet. This is the data sheet for a 12AT7 uh, twin triode. Um, similar to the 12AX7, these are high mu tubes. So they have a high gain. And they give you some information in here. Uh, you know, for example, they'll tell you what the uh, uh, they'll tell you what the maximum current that you'll get. Um, so let's see. They give you the mu value. Here it is. Okay. So um, plate current. Yeah. So the nominal with a hundred volt uh, bias, you get three point seven. Uh, milliamps in the plate current, 250 volts, you get 10 milliamps. Uh, then they have these curves. This is the important curve. Uh, it's the plate current, uh, it's the plate current versus the plate voltage, and under different values for the grid. Okay, so, um, and this is what goes into those spice models. And so what I did is, um, I went and made a little circuit. Uh, that's the transistor one. Yeah, here it is. Um, and yeah, so the I can generate these curves. So what I've got here is I've got an AC source. I'll make it. I'll go from zero to 400 volts. So I'll put 200 volts. And this is also something you can do safely if you're working with kids. You don't have to worry about them working with 400 volt power supplies. Uh, so I'm going to put in OK here. OK. So uh, what I've got here, I put the grid on here. So I see that uh, I'm getting up to 33 milliamps. Uh, at uh, almost 400 volts for this particular tube, and it's following that IV curve. I don't think that tube's going to like that too much. No, it won't. <laughs> so it, this one won't show that it's. Uh, yeah, but but the the max current. By the way, I hope everybody saw that great video that's been going around about make your own vacuum tube. Did everybody see that? <laughs> it was in the. Uh, what was it? It was on our. Uh, it was on the reflector. Communicated. Communicated, thank you. <laughs> so so Al, Al Clays flagged it and said, this is cool. So I, I had to look at it. If Al says something's cool, it's got to be cool. And so it was make your own vacuum tube. And they made their own vacuum tube. The filament that they used was just tungsten wire. Now, one thing that the one, this is one my one gripe with the thing. It turns out for vacuum tubes, they use thoriated uh, tungsten instead of pure tungsten, because it has a lower work function, so you get more current. So I don't think he was able to get that much uh, current uh, out of the tube. You just have to run it hotter. You can run it hotter, too, but then that, you can burn out your filament. So that's, uh, but in any case, uh, what I can do here is I can change the value of this, of the grid voltage. Okay, so let me just change the value. So that's minus a half a volt. Let's make it uh, minus two volts. And so I have a, I follow a different curve. And then this has persistence. So I actually can get the whole family of curves here and then can compare it to the data sheet. And then I did the same thing for a transistor. So here's a transistor uh, IV curve. This is the 
This is the collector current versus the V sub CE, it's the voltage across the collector to the emitter for different values of the base current. So these are sort of classic design uh, curves. And then um, I did the same thing. I made one of these here. Let's find the one. Yeah, here it is. So I'll click here. So let's see, I guess I'll do, uh, I can guess I can do, let's do five volts. Yeah, I guess I'll do five volts and five volt offset. So I'm always in the positive. And let me put okay. And then here I'm gonna change the value. So this is, this is, this transistor, what I'm doing is I'm putting a base current in that's basically, that's a milliamp in here. Okay, and then um, it's, it's a milliamp. And so this is a transistor that's driven to, uh, it's, it's saturated on. So that's like an, it's a switch. You can use a transistor as a switch. If I uh, put the base current to zero, I'll just show you that. So this is the concept of how you use a transistor as a switch. So let me put the voltage on the base to zero. Okay, then it's horizontal. Okay, so in that case, it's an open circuit. And then if I put it to something in between, let me put it to two volts. Okay, there it's, uh, it's regulating. I can put it to four volts. So I can generate basically a set of curves. Here's six volts, let's let it. So again, I can basically duplicate those um, results. Here's eight volts. So that's that family of curves. You use these curves for, for design. And here's the transistor, as I said, this is what uh, you typically would see for a transistor curve tracer. So again, you know, you want to teach yourself in electronics, you can go to the data sheets, you can see how it matches up with the different components. Really cool, re really easy to use. And I think very good for helping to explain how electronics works and also to get to sort of give a to put a tool in the hands of sort of the novice and to have them sort of teach themselves. I mean, yes. Yeah, and in these simulations, uh, the, the direction that the dots move seems to be opposite to the way electrons would be moving. So let's see, so the direction, uh, probably, it, it's probably convention, yeah. The Benjamin Franklin came up with the convention, and it's from plus to minus, and the electrons go the other direction. So, yeah, that's kind of bothersome. It's, uh, yep. Uh, so uh, there's a little bit. Charlie picked which, which uh, the, the, the uh, signs of the two kinds of electric charge, well, and he picked the opposite. Right. But there is, you know, in... hundred years later, they invented that J.J. Uh, Thompson discovered the electron. Yeah. Yeah, but it's especially bothersome with the vacuum tube because I know that the electrons are boiling off the cathode. Yes, oh, I see. But, you see. They're being drawn yes. backwards. Right. It's, it's hurting my brain. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's fair. <laughs> that's a fair statement. And um, so... You can't choose that with this, these simulations. Uh, there's possibly is a way to change it. So I've actually tried to fine tune some of the things here uh, unsuccessfully. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, in other words, they don't have the source code for it. So it's a, one of these Java applets that was written. Um, so I sort of accept, accept it uh, for, for that part for what it's worth. Um, but as I said, I absolutely love this in terms of the ability to explain some really difficult ideas. Um, and then they have uh, one other thing I'll, I'll, I want, with op amps. Uh, let me bring up another false stat. So uh, I've done some really cool things with op amps. Um, they have two different types of op amps. They have an ideal op amp. So, and you can draw it two different ways, and then they have a real op amp. So op amps have leakage current and other things that you have to worry about. And uh, for when you're trying to introduce uh, negative feedback circuits, it's often easier to not worry about the leakage and deal with sort of an, an idealized model. So I tend to use that a, a lot. But there are lots of different uh, 
I mean, there are lots of different elements that they have in there. And then there's a sort of whole industry of people out there that have sort of built circuits based on this. There's one that I also use. Um, if I put Falstad uh, H bridge, so an H bridge is used for running stepper motors. So here's a, so this is someone else did this. And where is the, uh, here it is. So they just, you know, this, oh, and it's, by the way, it's very easy to share your circuit. Um, if you go file and I do export as text, you can then just copy the text file and send it to someone. And then they can import it in to Falstad and then they'll get the same circuit. So this is a, an H bridge, there, these are, it's, a, it's a bridge circuit that allows you to reverse the direction of current from a single-ended uh, single voltage power supply. In this case, there's a plus and minus 12, but it could be just as easily be ground. As a matter of fact, let me do that. I'm pretty certain this will work if I make that zero volts. Okay, if I close this switch and I close this switch, it's not flowing that fast. Yeah, that's why I need the minus 12. Let me make this 24 volts. So it lights up. Okay, so you see those two switches closed. So this is run by N and P type uh, uh, MOSFETs. Uh, FETs are just like vacuum tubes. <laughs> so you notice the current's going from right to left. Then if I open up these two switches, and close these two switches. This is just biasing the FET. Then the current's going from left to right. So this is a way to reverse the direction of current from a single-ended power supply. This is very commonly used for uh, things like stepper motors, uh, bipolar stepper motors. But look, there's you know there's a whole lot more that I can tell you about, but I think I've sort of gotten to the sort of the key ideas here. And I just, uh, you know, I wanted to introduce it to the club because I think that you all can use this. I mean, it's all free. And it's open source. Sir. And it's all open source. It's online. It's, uh, it's well supported. It's a great way to teach yourself electronics and use it to explain a lot of technical electrical ideas to people that don't have a workshop. So I think uh, that's probably all I would. Yes. Yeah, on the uh, crystal uh, radio that you had there, I see yep. on most of them, they just have a, uh, what would happen if you had a full wave rectifier and would that distort the signal or would you get a better output? Or so so you can make a full wave rectifier very easily, uh, but you remember what it would give you, there's a, you know, there's a, a half a volt voltage drop typically uh, across a silicon diode so you would see the distortion associated with that uh, yeah but I mean there you know I'll, sh I'll show you one this is here's this is this is one that I do a lot it's with a, a push-pull amplifier and a feedback amplifier let me do this I'm sorry center tap you absolutely yeah you absolutely can so here, this is, this is one of the things that I do frequently. So I'm gonna do this with an op amp. So if you guys haven't been exposed to op amp circuits, op amps are based on negative feedback and negative feedback is great. <laughs> um, thank you, Harold Black. Yeah, thank you, Black, that's right. Okay, so here's, uh, I'm gonna put a wire. Here's a wire. Uh, ground, put an input resistor, okay, um, and then I'm going to feed this in, oops, I'm going to feed this into a, get some transistors here, um, let's see, active components, I want a bipolar, I'm going to do an NPN transistor, so let's see, the NPN will be here, and then I'm gonna do a PNP, oops, active components, here's a PNP transistor. I'll do it there. So this is a push-pull. Okay, let me just, you'll see this, this is, I, I really think that this is really cool. Okay, I'll 
put the two bases together. And then I'm going to feed this. This is this idea of crossover distortion. You'll see this in a second. I'll put to the collector, I'll put a one, uh, a one volt voltage source. Let's put this up to, I'll make this plus 15 volts. And then I'll put another one here. Make this to minus 15 volts. So this is a this is 15. Okay, and then I'm going to put a load here. So I'll put a, a wire and then a resistor to ground. Oh, whoop. Put a ground, G for ground. Okay, now let's put an AC source in here. Here's an AC two terminal source. Okay, I'll put this to ground. Okay, and then I'm going to look at the AC source in a scope. And I want to only look at the voltage. So I get rid of the current. And then I want to look at the view in a scope here. Properties, again, I only want to look at the voltage. And I'll stack these. Okay, and then I'll run it. So you see some crossover distortion. Okay. Yeah, now hang on a second. Let me drop the voltage a little bit. I'll drop it to three volts. It makes it a little bit more dominant. Okay, so you see this crossover distortion. See that? Okay, now. Yeah, so that's because, you know, there's a threshold associated with the transistor. But watch what happens if I, uh, let's stop this. If I pull this wire out and close the loop around to the load, reset. Within the loop. Yep. So what it does, so that's one of the things that feedback does for you is it, you know, it, it will linearize the system for you. So it actually gets rid of the crossover distortion. So this, you can use this to make a nice little audio amplifier. I have my students do this all the time. But again, to demonstrate the concept of just, you know, all you're doing is you're just, you know, just moving that one resistor, you know, so that it includes the nonlinear element and it gets rid of the distortion. Um, it also gets rid of, there was an amplitude drop because the, uh, the push-pull had a problem. So it actually, it, you, you get full amplitude and, uh, and you get rid of the crossover. Okay, so again, it's a great way to, you know, sort of demonstrate ideas really fast. If you try to wire this up in your, yourself, you know, it might take you half an hour, right? I can do this in three minutes. Okay, any other questions? I've probably gone on too long. Have I gone on too long? Yeah, that's what I went on for about an hour. That's that's good. And I stayed awake. I <laughs> Oh yeah, there's a there's a whole there's a whole lot that's out that there's a whole lot that's out there. Uh, and then, by the way, there are many other simulators. Um, so. Uh, you know, everybody's got their own sort of flavor of what they do. I got really into this. I had been using this probably for about 10 years, but just on and off. But when I started working with these kids in China, I found it was perfect because it was would run in a browser. You know, it was uh, easy to, uh, to show them how to do things. And I could also share the circuits by just sending the text file. So when I do in, uh, my course, what I do at the end of the course, I've, maybe I've had four or five little demonstrations like this, I will then uh, take those text files and email it to them. And then they can start with where, what I was doing rather than having to manually do it themselves. 
so it's just, it's just a really nice program. And then the Tinkercad one, just to reinforce that, that actually deals with a different part of the brain where you physically have to wire stuff up. And I, even this morning I did a Zoom session and the kids, I had asked them to wire up a, a, an amplifier, a linear amplifier. Um, uh, and, you know, they, they couldn't... Uh, they, they understood this, the schematic circuit, but they couldn't make the breadboard work and because they had some wires misplaced. It's, it's a topology thing. You're really using a different part of your brain when you're wiring a circuit than when you're sort of designing it. Okay. All right. All right, thanks.